How did that sound on the battlefield? In the foxholes, there weren't any instruments, there weren't any radios, and when those tones, regardless of how shrill they were out of this little plastic toy, wafted over the battlefield, you could just feel them listening. This bizarre looking battlefield was filled with these creatures, those of us who lived under the ground. Only a direct hit would kill us, but we were frightened. And these sounds drifted over. You could just, it was, it was beautiful. The one they loved the most was the German song, Lily Marlene. Let's see, how did that go? Um, As you can see in the dugout painting, there's a fellow spreading a shelter half. He's trying to get in, and we're crowded because they wanted to be near the music. In the painting, of course, I tried to express the crowded nature of it, and I remembered my lessons from a teacher of mine who taught us symbols of force, and I used them by having arrow forms come in on both sides to make them feel compressed, and then I pulled the guys knees up to their chins and in kind of distorted shapes. And so I tried to create the sense of compression and also that sense of being frightened and yet brave at the same time. And yet we were all waiting for the next shell. And there was shelling every single night. Every night. We just counted our blessings when we got up in the morning and, and weren't hit. Sheer hell is going on on that island. You can see it. You can hear it. It rolls over the water. You can hear that thunder. And then the word comes from the bridge. Uh, all Marines lay down to your debarkation stations and your heart flutters. And, and it's amazingly quiet. There isn't a lot of shouting and talking and hubbub. The kind of control you have to have over yourself, these, all these men have that. So they're keeping their innermost fears quiet. They don't express them. They show concern for each other. I, that impressed me. I, being a good Irish Catholic, I made the sign of the cross. And I had to put my foot over that railing. That is when you want to. You're saying Hail Marys, but you want to throw up, too. You'd give anything if you could go the other way. But you know you have to go. You have to go down. and You, you beg the good Lord to see you through it, and please let me see home again. And then there's that thick rope under your foot, and it you go down that net, you have to be aware of people below you, preceding you. You don't want to step on them. You don't want somebody to step on you a couple of times or you'll feel a foot on your hand. You're carrying a lot of weight. The pack is probably a good 60, 65 pounds and biting into your shoulders. You got your, your rifle is, uh, over your shoulder, slapping against you as you go down. You tie your helmet so that it won't fall off at that point. Uh, your muscles are aching. Your insides are full of fear as you make your way down that net. And there's, the main sounds are not voices, they're just the sounds of equipment. 
but you make your way down this side of the ship and it seems to be down the side of a tall building. Those boats are far below that you're heading for. And they're riding up and down, probably 10 feet or more. If I thought we saw chaos before, this is even worse. I can't tell you the number of bodies of American Marines that were lying face down in the water. I have one painting of that. And I, I thought long and hard about when I made the painting, should I show how many there were? Well, now I need a big canvas for that. So when I thought, one says it all for all of them. So I did one body, and I call it the last full measure. We left so many out there. To see an American Marine lying dead with a bullet in his head was enraging. We knew we had to dominate that island. When you get up in an area where there is a great deal of action and in the front line, I was quite surprised the attitudes of people change. In other words, there's a certain amount of uh, kindness and softness and uh, consideration for one another and uh, you're uh, in a different world it seems like heaven almost i hate to that's funny isn't it heaven why is that heaven that isn't heaven it's hell but people are nice good even in, in, in fact you forget about who the other person is that person might be not your same uh, color or background, but you, you forget about that. You, you forget about it. Everybody seems to be okay. And then you leave that area and you come back into the rear and it becomes more apparent that what you've seen is something that's quite unique and special. The proudest moment I ever had was when I saw that kid in the Anzio field have his leg blown off, and I ran out into the field to help him. I didn't know quite what to do, and an aid man came up in a jeep just after me, and my, the captain of my company that I was with was yelling at me, Reap, Reap, come back here, come back here, come back. And I said, the hell with him. I'm going out there and trying to help this guy. Well, that was, I thought, a very good act. And I was trying to vindicate myself for having stayed in that foxhole. And then when we were driving into the hospital, I was sitting in the back and we went over a bump and he was ice cold. And I said, he's dead. And he opened his eyes, he said, the hell I am. We used to think, oh God, maybe we'll be home in a year. Well, a year comes and goes, and people talk about 18 months. We couldn't imagine anybody being gone 18 months, and 18 months goes by, and you're into two years, and you're into three years. And you forget about going home after a while. Home becomes very faint and distant in your memory. Finally, after four years, the most violent war in history was over. American combat artists had created more than 12,000 paintings and drawings under some of the worst conditions possible. Most of the work would quickly vanish from view. It had served its purpose. The troops were coming home. On the ship, there were many patients who were in bed all the time and had to have a lot of tension from nurses and so forth. So they said, now when we get within the Golden Gate Bridge, please tell us. Some of them convinced the other people to carry them up on deck. So it was so dramatic when we got near San Francisco and they really could see the Golden Gate. That was home. That was a symbol of, my God, I've made it back alive. I lived outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, up on a little 
mountain outside of town and I could look down and see the road coming out from town and I think this would be a good place to have a gun mounted here to stop the traffic. I mean, I got to thinking military terms. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy, really crazy. I think I had done about 150 paintings that were sent back to Washington. Everything I did was taken from me. I couldn't even tear up things that I didn't like. It was property of the army. I really was very unhappy about everything I did, but I had an exhibit not too long ago, and suddenly I said, they're not bad. I was asked to come down to see a colonel about uh, staying in the army. I thought about it. He made it very tempting. He wanted to make me a major and send me to Austria for the army of occupation. And uh, I looked at him. I kept looking at him, and I kept looking at his mouth. It was very straight and stern. And he had steely gray eyes and clipped speech. Captain Reap, dip, 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 dip. And so I said, God, no, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. I said, no, I want to go home. I don't want to be in the reserve. I don't want to go over to Austria. I don't want to do anything. I just want to go home. And I was dismissed. And uh, I was home. I feel the human is more beautiful in proximity to life and death. His emotions are more deeply felt. I've seen men who would take from you behind the lines, give to you on the line. I've seen men give profoundly. War, for all its negation, there is a beauty there when we're facing life and death. that I've seen and experienced and I'm thankful for it. 